that sounded awesome. Hopefully you guys have been blessed uh, by the uh, prayers that have been sent out over the past uh, few weeks that Adrian's been sending. And isn't it neat kind of hearing and remembering those prayers from our uh, campaign a couple years ago? And, and to have that come has just been a real blessing to me. And I, I pray that you will take a moment to fill out a prayer request. You're like, well, I don't know. Should I do it? Boy, um, James 5.16 tells us the prayers of a righteous man and woman are powerful and effective. And I hope we believe that. And what an opportunity it is that if you have a prayer request to have a couple hundred people come up here and pray over that and lift that prayer up before God. Uh, what an opportunity. I hope you'll take advantage of that and also take advantage. I know our uh, small group is going to be coming up here at the same time. We're going to go eat four and just share that time together and, and with our children and everything. So I hope that you'll take advantage of that. And Hoy will talk about that at the close of our services. If you are getting ready to go on vacation, you've got a week, or boy, wouldn't it be great if you had two weeks, how do you prepare to go on vacation? What are some of the things you do? Well, if you and your roommate or friend or, or your spouse or your family or anything like Jill and me and the kids, we plan for months. Once we choose a destination, well, we'll get online and we'll say, if we're going to go to this place, what is something that each one of the family wants to go and do? Uh, Jill sometimes get travel books, and uh, we'll talk with friends that have been to that destination, make sure that uh, we don't miss anything. And if we're going to be traveling in the car, you know, easily a week out, I'll, I'll take it into the mechanic and get him to service it, uh, change the oil, check the belts and other fluids and stuff, make sure the tires are aired up. Uh, Jill will, will go and get a brand new DVD that the kids haven't seen, so they'll be excited. Uh, she'll also pick out a, a, a book for the family for us to read through. Um, and these are just some of the things that we do. Maybe download some new tunes on the iPod. Uh, I'll also stick in our folder of Bible Bowl questions for our kids. They love it when we go over those for hours on end. Uh, but as we're, as we're driving and getting ready to head out the driveway, I have to tell you, Jill has the car loaded down with snacks that, that we'll love and uh, we'll have drinks. And there's not a chance that we're going to get lost because my navigator would make Ferdinand Magellan feel inadequate because she's loaded with her triple A fold out uh, map from the travel club and she has her map quest printout. We also have the Garmin Nuvi plugged in that constantly telling us to read, you know, to recalculate. Uh, and then she also has her I I phone right there and she's watching a little blue dot. I mean, there's no way we're going to get lost. We make preparations for our vacation. Why do we want to do this? Because it's such an important time. When you go out, you want to reconnect with those you love. You also want to recharge your kind of emotional batteries. What about our spiritual batteries? What about our spiritual development? Do we have the same planning? Do we take that much time? Or do we have a game plan? Do we think about it? Do we plan what are we doing for our spiritual development? Are we really taking it as serious as even our vacation time? Do we invest the same amount of energy into planning our time of renewal with our Heavenly Father? Unfortunately, it, it seems to me that, that many folks are, are pretty random with their efforts and experience uh, this kind of God-driven God -driven transformation. We, we just kind of are kind of haphazard about things. Although the, the Lord lays out in scriptures the path to righteousness and the path to wholeness. I mean, it's right there for us. These are some things that we should be about. And we have examples of men and women of faith that have accomplished what we hope to accomplish. But yet sometimes we want to keep that at arm's distance. We want sometimes to go it alone. And we want to kind of take that as one input, but we also want to stay in control and sometimes we have a hard time turning over our spiritual development to God. George Barnett in his book, Maximum Faith, describes our discipleship walks as sort of a mindless mutiny. This is what he says. We refuse to give God control of our lives. But we're really not guiding the ship towards a particular destination that reflects our ultimate best interests. We just keep meandering in the ocean of life, hoping to find an appealing place to dock 
Does that sound like us? Or do we just kind of drift along from year to year? Or are we focused? Do we know where we're going? And are we working towards that, allowing God to guide us? Let's go back to our 10 stops that we've been going through in this series on discipleship. And we talked last week that a full 56% of folks, uh, whether they are ignorant or whether they are indifferent, or where they are just kind of spiritually concerned, 56% of folks have not accepted Jesus Christ. That's in the United States. That should be very troubling to us. Well, quick math would tell you that a full 44% have made some type of a concerted effort to give themselves over to the Lord. So 44%. Now, whether that is saying the believer's prayer or if that was making some type of confession uh, or it's through immersion or some other experience, that's for another day. But what do we do? What do we do from this point forward for those that have professed a belief of, and, and have put their faith in Jesus Christ and have admitted that they are powerless without Jesus? Where do we go from here? What happens after this? Well, the next stop in the journey depends on what precipitated the immersion into the salvation experience that we see at stop number four. Because see, for a lot of people, they don't always see their spiritual life as a progressive or a linear adventure. And a portion of people will treat this as the pinnacle. This is it. Once I have become baptized, you know, I I put myself out there and I've gone through the waters of baptism. That's it. That was my peak. And in essence, if I'm going up and I've reached this, well, then I begin to go back. And they basically return to their same level of religious activity and spiritual death as they had prior to this religious experience. And you talk with folks, and you're like, how are you doing in your faith? Oh, I've been baptized. Oh, yeah, my, my sins have been washed away. That's taken care of. Don't have to worry about that. And it's almost like a transaction. And we think of it almost like buying life insurance. Yeah, you get to meet the agent. It's kind of nice. You kind of go over your options. And yeah, okay, but once you do that, you mark it off the list. We're insured. We're taken care of. Let's move on. We mark it off the list. I'm good, and I'm covered. But others, after confessing the name of Jesus, and they get to this point, even take a step backwards. How in the world does that happen? We talked last week about the parable of the sower found in Luke chapter 8. And you can turn over there if you want. Hopefully it's a familiar story to us. But we, we talked about last week how that the seed that's being cast is the word of God. It's the gospel message the Lord has prepared for us. But, but depending on how what's going on with our heart will determine how well that's received. And so Jesus says this, cast out the seed that falls on the path. Well, these are the folks that, that hear the word, but before it can really take hold, Satan comes in with a full court press and makes sure that that gets surgically removed. It is cut off, it's severed before it can really be absorbed into the heart and be fully accepted. The next is a seed that falls on the rocky soil. And these are believers that, that joyfully receive the word but really have no root. You know, I, I, while I think they have a place and a purpose Sometimes I'm not a big fan of big Christian events, whether that's uh, a Christian band coming through or promise keepers, or I know we've got like House of Judgment and, and other Christian haunted houses around in, in the area. Where you go to these events and people can respond, I want to give my life to Jesus, and they write it on a card and pass it forward. And guess what? What happens after that event? Well, the tents come down, the, the speakers hop on a plane and, and go somewhere else. The band hops back on their tour bus and goes, and they leave behind spiritual orphans, people that have somehow come to Christ but have no one to disciple them, no place to go, no one to help them grow and to develop. And so that's the seed that falls them on the rocky soil, and it will not last for long before they fall away. And finally, there's a seed that falls among the thorns. Faith that grows a little deeper, that really gets going good, but is eventually choked out by life's worries, riches, and pleasures. And look what it says in Luke chapter 8 and verse 14. And they do not mature. You know, 
there is, I think it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing that I've seen in my, my working with folks. Certainly those that pursue life's pleasures and, and, and find themselves consumed with worries and, and riches. And these things become all-consuming. It, it does choke out faith. But here's what I also see. Those that do not mature in the faith are more susceptible to falling victim to these things. Of allowing the lure of pleasure to pull them away. Of allowing riches to become all-consuming. Of allowing themselves to, to get occupied by what's happening in this world that they're so worried because they have not matured. And so they're an easier target for Satan to fall into these traps of life. Well, how many accept Jesus? I'm just kind of stop here. In the Barnes survey, it was about 9%. Oh, they're, they're convicted, and they've come to Jesus, but this is as far as they're going to go on life's journey with Him. Well, others will see stop four as a departure into a different kind of a spiritual experience. And, and what they realize is, I've come to Jesus, but I need help. I, I don't know enough. I, I, I need some help and support from a Christian community. And so most will join a church and become a part of a community of faith. And as the, the guys read this morning from the book of James, that to say, you, yes, I have faith, but you don't follow that up with any type of action, well, that faith is no faith at all. So there's a real desire in today's day and age to pursue a kind of spirituality apart from a spiritual community. In my reading of Scripture, apart from uh, maybe John the Baptist, I just don't see that as a model for discipleship of saying, yeah, me and God are good, but me and God are going to be over here, and I'm not going to be a part of a community that will hold me accountable, that will help me grow and nurture. I just don't see it. Most people realize that they need further training, and so they also need encouragement and instruction. And if you think about what we provide on Sunday mornings and and Wednesday nights, classes at church, I, I really want to encourage you. Steve Krieger has put together a fantastic Wednesday night lineup And hopefully this series is designed to motivate us towards taking steps in our spiritual growth. But a lot of what we're providing on Wednesday nights and on Sunday morning is the how-to. And so you can sit at the feet of of people that can talk to you about the Holy Spirit, that can talk to you about prayer, that can talk about some of the spiritual disciplines that will help you accomplish these things. I hope you'll take advantage of that. And so these become some of the things that we're seeking after. And so after a period of time, we start growing in a deeper understanding of God's Word and also the ongoing meta-narrative, what God has been doing over the course of history and how we get dropped into that. That's what we're hoping. But there's also an expectation for personal growth and investment in things like Bible study and quiet time and time in prayer. And of course, what a blessing it is to have an older brother or sister in Christ, someone that's walked down this road, that's further along in this journey, say, hey, let let me reach back and give you a hand and help you up, how valuable that is. In addition, at this stop, you begin identifying spiritual gifts and and ways to get involved and ways, uh, opportunities to serve. And so we see that being a part of a fellowship of believers not only is beneficial for you, but it's also good for the church. One of my favorite passages is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Why? To prepare God's people for works of service so that the whole body of Christ may be built up in all we, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's why we're here. We're all gifted in different ways. We all have a different story. Why do we come together collectively? So we get a better understanding of who our Heavenly Father is. We understand what Jesus has done, but we also tap into each other's gifts and abilities to strengthen us so that we can serve more, but also mature into who God would have us to be. It's been said that each of us as Christians are... Uh, that we're all like uh, a multifaceted diamond that has so many different cuts. And each one of us kind of serves as a different surface that reflects what God's done in our life. And we're, we come together, we're not one-dimensional. 
but we see what God is doing in each other's lives, and we can grow from that because each of us reflect and teach each other based on what God is doing in our lives. All in all, going through this stop satisfies a couple of things. It, it helps us feel a part of things. And if you're a new, new Christian, suddenly you're joining a group of other believers. So there's a sense of belonging and, and purpose. But it also helps to jumpstart this new creation that Jesus talked about. Being born again, become this new person. Definitely that helps us. Those that stop number five, those that are committed are at 24. They've made a commitment to this journey. They're saying, I'm not going to just say, I believe in Jesus. I'm actually going to start walking this out and becoming a part of this. But is this stop enough? After years of commitment to faith activities, is it possible for us to slip into a sort of spiritual coma? If we're not careful, faith really can be rituals, it can be routines, recitations, rules, and responsibilities. You know, how easy for it is for us to walk in to worship, to sit down and kind of do our thing. Maybe go off to an ABF class or downstairs with the teens and you kind of walk through that and then let, later on in the evening you'll get together with your small group and you just kind of show up and oh, then you also got something that, you know, the girls in the office have sent you responsibility. You know, I've got to do this and I've got some ministry stuff. And so we do this week after week, month after month, year after year. And sometimes we can find ourselves just going through the motion without noticing you know, some of the spiritual goals and some of the dreams we had of being really close with our Heavenly Father, sometimes that becomes a little more relaxed. We're no longer stretching our faith and, and really striving for what God would have us to come next. No, climbing to new heights. That's what He's calling us to, to keep growing. Sometimes we exchange our passion for God for just comfort in our spiritual walk. You talk with folks, how are you? I'm at a good place. Things are, are going okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm doing okay. God's calling us to so much more. Those that level off at stop number five seem content to engage their religious life on autopilot. But others seek and express their feelings at stop number six. It's what I call spiritual discontent. They're saying, it's not enough. Is this all I signed up for? Is this as good as it gets? Lord, I want so much more. I don't want to stay here. I don't want to just keep going through the motions. And so we're painfully aware of our personal spiritual growth as plateaued. And we're unwilling to accept this. We're unwilling to accept the lethargy. This time, we want to be serious about our faith. We want to ask the right questions. And we, we want to seek after answers. But I have to tell you, I need to warn you, that when we get to this point, good things can happen. But also, we can easily find ourselves drifting into cynicism, doubt, and frustration. Because if God hadn't provided the growth that I was told I would receive, what kind of a God is He? If the bride of Christ, the church, if this is all it is, I'm not sure I want that. So we become discontent. We start asking questions and start separating ourselves out. And so it seems pretty interesting that at a point of a journey where we're seeking, we take a step back. That makes no sense. We took, should take a step forward. Well, what does it look like if you're at stop number six? Through introspection, you begin to realize that besides being, as, as Art talked about, saved by the, the blood of Christ on the cross, and, and, and we know this, we, we know about God's grace and His forgiveness, and we're beginning to walk out this new creation, but you start looking around, and you're like, I'm still self-reliant. I'm still self-indulgent. I'm still selfish, and I'm still sinful. Lord, where is this change that you promise? Despite these holdovers from the old life, 
We know that God is eager. He's eager for each one of us to have a relationship with him. Don't, don't we know that? And as parents, we know how much we love our children and desire a strong relationship. Our Heavenly Father is the same way. But sometimes when it comes to our relationship with God, we, we just suffer from self-doubt. Secretly, we wonder, where is this peace that passes all understanding? I, I should be perfectly content with everything. Why am I so worried about the direction of the country? Why am I so worried about the upcoming election? Why am I so worried about the economy? Why are you so worried about your job? Why are you so worried about your 401k? And so all these things just become consuming. You're like, where's the peace that I read about this? About martyrs that are willing to just go to their death. Why are we so consumed? Where's that peace? Where we might get our hands on that joy has talked about being the reward of those that follow after Christ. Do we settle for things that kind of make us happy as a substitute for true inner joy? Where is that joy? And what about the all-compassing love? Just something that's supposed to be our hallmark, our calling card. They will know Christians by their love. But sometimes I, I struggle loving not just folks across the seas, but folks across the street. Are we any different? Do we love folks more than those that don't know Christ? And so we start looking at these things going, where's our peace? Where's our joy? Where's our love? And deep down, we know something is missing. Something is off. We may be happy, but we lack joy. We may be satisfied. But deep down, if, if we really start looking, we don't feel fulfilled. Maybe we're at ease, but not truly content. And those that kind of find themselves in this spiritual malaise start asking these questions. And, you know, they, they find themselves drifting to books like Job. So, you know what? If I'm going to open it, I'm going to go to Lamentations or, you know, perhaps Ecclesiastes. Solomon had it right. All this is meaningless. Why do we even do these things? I've tried these things and it hasn't worked out. What's the challenge for us? I, I hate to leave us at stop six. Please come back next week. It, it gets a lot better, but it's challenging. It's going to be the most challenging lesson in this series. Where are we? For those of you that have professed Jesus, haven't made a commitment to your personal growth, I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to get into a Bible study. I encourage you to get into a small group of folks that can challenge you, that can encourage you, and keep you on the straight and narrow and hold you accountable. You have to be purposeful in what you're trying to do. Commit yourself to your walk. For those of you that moved on to stop number six, you know who you are. You've been reading Crazy Love. You've been reading Radical. You've been reading some other stuff going, oh my. I, and, and there's this inner turmoil within you. And you're feeling a sense of holy discontentment. I want to tell you, don't be embarrassed. There's a good chance that this season that you're going through is coming from God. He's trying to jar you loose. He doesn't want you to plateau. He doesn't want you to be satisfied. He doesn't want you to settle. God wants us to reevaluate and, and want more, to hunger more in our relationship with Him in life. He's calling us to climb higher. But get ready. I have to tell you, when you get to this point in your pilgrimage, the next step up is not a gradual, it's a big step. It's a big step, and we'll talk about that next week. It's important for us, but we need to realize that if we keep going, it's a monumental choice that we've got to make. But there's good news ahead, I have to tell you. If we pursue God and really go after Him, His continuous grace is going to be there for us that have been seeking peace and joy in the wrong places and the wrong practices, and the wrong people, and the wrong perspective. God's like, I know, I know you've tried this. So many people have tried it. Please come to me. I want to have grace to help you through this. And genuine peace and fulfillment is within our grasp if we will let go of some of our self-defeating ways. Trust God. Trust God to help us Return to the path that leads to righteousness. The path that re returns to wholeness that he promises. Like a runner in a race, sometimes you get to the point where your body is saying, what are you doing out here? You can't finish. That was me in the 5K, but 
uh, I was running with my son. I didn't want him to leave me behind. But you, your body says you have no business being in this race. And so it starts telling you and feeding you down. To, You're probably going to die. You know, stop where you are. But you have to pass through that. You have to overcome that. Not just in running a race. God is calling us to finish strong in our spiritual race. Not to quit. The mountain climber Greg Child put it this way. Somewhere between the bottom of the climb and the summit is the answer to the mystery of why we climb. Isn't that true? God wants us to seek that mystery. You know, when when we have little pad answers, we get to kind of controlling God. God's like, okay, I'm going to mess you up a little bit because I want you to keep looking. There's more to this mystery than what you think. Keep pursuing him. If you find yourself at any one of these six stops, God is calling you to more. He's calling you to totally give yourself over to him. To go for the mystery that he is revealing within each one of us. And guess what? The more we get to know God, the more we begin reflecting him with ever-increasing glory. Let's pray together. Father, as we are talking about making faith commitments, of taking our discipleship serious at stop number five. And Lord, for for those that have been serious for a long time, but still feel a sense of of longing, still feel somewhat of of discontent, Lord, I ask that you strengthen both of those types of folks. But Lord, I, I know that there are others that their mind hasn't been able to move beyond stop number two. They've got a son or a daughter, a wife or a husband, that, Lord, remains indifferent, indifferent to the story of Jesus. And, Lord, it, it's so confusing for us when we have think, when the story of Jesus and what the gospel message that saves us is so central to who we are, the passion that drives us for those that we love tremendously to be indifferent. It breaks our heart, Lord. Lord, I want to offer up a prayer for the prodigals, that they will come home, that seeds will be cast, And Lord, that seed will make it way into their heart. And Lord, you will provide the growth and bring them back. Lord, plant within us all a seed of holy discontent that we can continue growing in you, that we won't settle. But Lord, you will develop us into the people you would have us to be. Change us, Lord, with ever-increasing glory. Christ, let me pray.